Well, good afternoon and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens. Let's talk gardens. My name is Cindy Brown. I am the Education and Collections Manager at Smithsonian Gardens, and we're excited to have you here with us today. A bit chilly in the mid uh, Atlantic area today, in between hiccups of warm weather and colder weather. So we know spring is springing because that's what our spring weather is like. So we're excited to have you here and we're very excited to have Eric Evans with us today. I'll introduce Eric in just a bit, but first I want to remind you to please put your questions in the chat box during our discussion today and we'll get to as many as possible at the end. This, this webinar will be recorded and be available in our Smithsonian Gardens uh, Let's Talk Gardens video library, which is on our website, of course. So if you want to review this, you'll be able to do it in a couple weeks after we finish editing the closed captioning. We really would like to invite you, if possible, to our gorgeous orchid exhibit that's at the Kogod Courtyard, which is the beautiful indoor space between Smithsonian American Art Museum and the National Portrait Gallery. It will be going on to April 24th, but if you don't have a chance, go on our website and visit that because we have videos and images of the orchids and discussions about the orchids that I think you would find very engaging no matter where you live. So with that, Eric, how are you today? I'm doing great, Cindy. <laughs> I say that because Eric has just moved from the West Coast to the East Coast, so we know that he's suffering a bit from jet lag and all that other fun experience when you're going from one side of the United States to the other. So I wish you the best for this presentation. <laughs> Stay awake. Um, and we are going to hear about a subject that we don't often talk about in the gardens. We know that horticulture is a combination of science and art. And you can see it in our gardens, but Eric's going to open up our eyes to some of the, the factors that fit into this, some of the elements that we should consider when we're considering high art in horticulture. It'll be a new one for me too. So Eric, I'm going to go ahead and disappear. Why don't you take it over from here, please, and tell us a little bit more about yourself and then get into the gorgeous pictures that you've saved for us for horticulture in the gardens across the United States and more. Thank That's you, good. Eric. I'll be back. All right. Hello. Yes, my name is Eric Evans. Um, and until about a couple weeks ago, I was on the Hort staff at the San Diego Botanic Garden. I'm lucky enough um, now to be interning at Chanticleer. It's sort of a dream come true. Um, and in the past, I was also a seasonal horticulturist or um, uh, an assistant horticulturist at the William Peca Gardens, which is a historic gardens in the historic district of Annapolis. Um, and so those are three very different gardens. Um, and I, I wanna try to give you uh, an overview that isn't biased towards um, historical gardening or towards ornamental gardening or towards botanic collection specimen gardening. Um, I have experience with all of them and I, I like all of them and I see all of their value. And I hope that that um, means that my perspective here is, is fairly well balanced. <laughs> you can tell me if it's not. Um, I'll get started. Um, I love the Smithsonian Gardens um, and I did not used to be uh, a person who was always interested in plants. I tell people I was a plant blind person for most of my life. And it was the way plants were presented at certain public gardens that really got me interested in plants. And the Smithsonian Gardens is one of them. And now that I have a bit of context um, here and I've been working in horticulture for about a decade now, um, I wanted to take this opportunity to think about um, what the Smithsonian Gardens does, what is the level on which it's relating to this um, art of horticulture? Um, and I can't do that without kind of setting the scene. So we're going to look at a series of gardens throughout history um, to see how we got here in horticulture. Um, and a little bit of a disclaimer here. Um, I'm not a garden historian and I will be leaving some very influential gardens out, but I'll try to um, name drop them as we go. 
Um, but here we go. So I wanted to show you this slide here. This is the gravel garden at Chanticleer. This is Lisa Roper's work. Um, and it's one of my favorite gardens in the world. And it's very widely recognized as an excellent garden. And if we wanna take this as an example of a great modern garden, um, there are some things to explain here. So why does Lisa Roper, who's in, you know, who's operating out of Pennsylvania near Philly, why is she planting out um, a Mesoamerican agave Americana every year? Um, where does that, where does she get the idea that that's a thing to do? Um, all of these grasses and all the beautiful flowering plants that come and go in succession, where is that idea coming from? Where's the idea that such a loose and atmospheric design is desirable? All of these things um, were at certain times, um, we can trace those ideas to certain gar uh, ideas in gardening that are typified by certain gardens. So I wanna take this as a great example of showing, here's where we end up, here's the present day, and how do we get here? Um, and these are the, some of the questions we're going to ask. So um, does the garden aim to engage the intellect? Um, we might say that is, you know, is the garden intended as at least one of its purposes? Is it intended to enrich a knowing experience of the natural world? Not just an aesthetically appreciative experience of the, national, of the natural world, but um, a knowing experience of it. Or is it aiming to engage a sense of beauty? Um, does the garden engage plants as providing a setting? That, is that to say a planted space is a venue? Or does the garden engage plants as objects within a setting? Do you go to that place to see the plants? Is the plant the being that you're engaging with in that place? Um, does the garden mimic an ecology? Or is it some kind of um, intentional artifice? And I don't mean that artificial is bad. I just mean it's not. Uh, based on a natural uh, model of any kind. Um, is the fundamental unit of the garden, is it a plant? What is a garden made out of? Is it a plant or is it combinations? Is it pairs of plants that react with their neighbors? Um, that's a, those are different approaches. Does the garden engage mood? Where does mood come from in the garden? And lastly, does the garden result from plant exploration or maybe on the other hand, does it use more commonly available plants? Again, not that one is better or worse um, and not that they're mutually exclusive. You can have a garden that does both, um, but a lot of these, um, these so-called opposites are not mutually exclusive, but they are opposites. Um, another disclaimer here is you might be really excited that I'm about to talk about um, uh, the history of gardening in all parts of the world. And I wanna, I wanna ad admit that a lot of these are Western examples. Um, I'd love to talk about Rianji in, in Kyoto, for example, the really famous um, uh, rock garden there. But you have to understand that that garden is part of a temple. And so it's not a garden as we would define it in the West. In the West, a garden exists as its own goal, whereas that garden exists as a meditation tool and it's meant as symbolism. Um, and so there is absolutely garden artistry going on, but it's hard to take that example and then just transpose lessons willy-nilly into Western gardens without losing a lot of the content here. So I just understand that I'm not talking about gardens throughout the whole world because a lot of the cultural assumptions don't transfer, even if you transfer individual little pieces of, of material or little ideas. Um, so, but we'll, we'll return to that idea. So I want to start by talking about the Orto Botanico di Padova, which is sometimes considered by historians to be the first botanical garden. Obviously, there's beautiful symmetry going on here. There's beautiful shapes, um, and the plots are very, very intentional. Um, but one of the interesting things about this garden is that it was designed to uh, house and grow uh, plants that had potential commercial or medicinal value. And that being the case, the, um, the, the way the plants are actually laid out in space is meant to be an aid to memory. So say I'm a person who's a, a missionary and I'm training and I'm a deeply religious person, which I would have had to have been to be at a university at this time. Um, and I say, well, I'm gonna go somewhere far away, but I need to 
be able to know what the plants are there because if somebody needs medicinal help or something, um, I need to be able to know those plants. And so if I can remember where it is in the beds in this garden, then I can remember what its medicinal use is because that's how these plants are laid out. So this, um, the whole layout of the garden is in a sense, a mnemonic device. It helps you learn and understand the use of the plants. That being the case, it's not planted intentionally as with a, any kind of aesthetic agenda. So its point isn't to be beautiful, not that it isn't, but its point isn't to be beautiful. Um, and one thing I might say about that is that um, maybe it is beautiful in a religious sense. And again, these are people who would have been deeply religious. I think there's a sense that plant taxonomy of which this garden is meant to be uh, an explanation or a, a way of showing um, that plant taxonomy is maybe a God's eye view of the reality of the natural world. And so I think there's a divine beauty that the plants are participating in. That's not quite a human thing, but maybe this is the way God sees the beings of the natural world. I think there may be that kind of beauty going on, but again, it's not planted for any kind of human aesthetic agenda. The next thing I'll talk about is Andre Lenotre. Um, and you'll know his work from Versailles and the Tuileries. And on the left there, that photo is of Fontainebleau. Beautiful stuff, but it's obviously very, very different. This clearly is not meant to, um, to be educational in any way. It is meant to be aesthetic in a certain way. You can see that the way the plants are lined out is very architectural and it is meant to extend the um, interior architecture of the buildings outdoors. And one thing of note here, love those topiaries, by the way, those are my favorite topiaries I've ever seen. Those are at Versailles. <laughs> um, one thing of note is that to the extent that um, this space is thought of as being a venue for events or beings of interest, um, those beings of interest are people, right? So you don't come here to have an interrogative experience with a plant. You come here to make a deal with a politician, right? You come here to have a society dinner. Um, this, is, um, this is plants as creating a sense of place. Um, not that that's necessarily native plants creating a native sense of place. It's certainly not mimicking, eco mimicking an ecology, but um, we do have plants creating space and having aesthetic value in a way that they didn't in the uh, Orto Botanico de Padova. The next thing I'll talk about is Sir Joseph Banks. Um, we have sort of Western plant exploration, often with really dark undersides. Um, if you see the right hand photo there, that's the breadfruit. And if you ever heard of the mutiny on the bounty, the point of that expedition was to get breadfruit plants and bring them back to the Caribbean where it was thought they might make cheap and nutritious food for slave labor. Um, so I don't love that <laughs> that happened or that that is the way people were engaging with plants. But there is at this time, I think something that feels very relatable now, which is the sense of the world as containing exotic, interesting plants that are worth having and sharing and going somewhere to get and bringing them back. I think if you have a monstera in your living room, for example, this, there's a little bit of this attitude that um, the light side of this attitude that I think is great. And I think underlies a lot of modern botanic gardens and a lot of sort of uh, amateur plant collection. If you have a camellia in your garden, well, guess what? That dates from a camellia craze. Um, and it's not an accident that you have a camellia in your at your house and that it's a landscape plant. But there was a time when that was a really exotic thing to have and it took a lot of time and work and money to, to get a camellia. Um, I'll then move to Bernard McMahon and Thomas Jefferson. Um, what gardens are doing at this time is really interesting. And if, you, if you've ever heard of the genus Mahonia, if you have a Mahonia at your house, close relative of Mandina, um, Mahonia is actually referenced to Bernard McMahon. And Bernard McMahon um, was one of the Philadelphia nurserymen who grew out seedlings, uh, seeds collected on the Lewis and Clark expedition. And it's where Thomas Jefferson sourced a lot of his plants. 
Uh, and his, uh, his uh, 1806 Philadelphia catalog is really worth a read if you've never taken a look at it before. Some of the plants that he offers are gumfrina and hibiscus and impatiens and ice plants and dragon trees and ficus and oh gosh, agave and aloes and alstroemerias and all sorts of fun things that I think we still feel pretty cool that we're growing. And he had them in 1806 and you could, you could buy them. One of the things that's interesting here that I really like, um, especially as it relates to Thomas Jefferson, is that there's a sense of native plants are exotic um, and they're worth our time. And I think right now we live in a time where plants are, are exotic and interesting or native and boring. <laughs> I hope we're coming out of that actually. I think we're kind of a ways out of that. But I think with Thomas Jefferson, there's this great idea of now, actually, we have native plants that are really funky and cool, and it, their uses are unknown, and let's plant them, and let's try them out, and I really like that spirit. Um, this is an example from the William Pekka Garden where I worked, less because it's a world-famous garden, um, so much as it really encapsulates some of the ideas here. So we have on the left there, you can still see the symmetry, those, that formalism has... Um, there's a little bit of that formalism in the form of these parterre gardens. If you go to the Smithsonian, the Ina de Haupt garden is also a parterre style where there are sort of squares that are partitioned off into garden rooms. Um, you'll notice though at the bottom in the center there is the summer house and the summer house is in a garden space that's a little bit more naturalistic. The lawn is not, but, but everything behind it is actually called the wilderness. And this was a fashion at the time to have a wilderness. So you'd have a more formal garden close, closer to your, to the actual uh, house, to the actual architecture, but further out, you'd have a wilderness garden where you would explore um, native plants and what their uses might be. And again, that might've had an exploitative side. It might be, how can we make money off of this native horse chestnut or something? Um, can it be a crop that feeds people? Um, cheaply, but there is also joy in that exploration, and I really like that. You can also see at the top right here is sort of a, a flower parterre that uses some native plants as elements, and then also a working kitchen kitchen garden. So these division of the gardens into their uses and these nice little garden rooms. Um, the Victorian specimen craze. The Victorians are really interesting, and I think if you got you know 20 Victorian you know plant enthusiasts in a room there's not a lot that they would agree on so it's very difficult to characterize this phase of garden making um, but a few things uh, really stand out to us which is that certain um, plants that we now consider as common ornamentals first really came to prominence here some of those are some of the ferns and some of the fuchsias and begonias and cannas and all that stuff um, on the right here, you have a Wardian case, sort of the first real kind of thing that I think we get terrariums from. Um, and so those were to show off your specimens as well as sort of keep them uh, out of reach of sort of maybe smog or, or smoke polluted air. One of the things that I find really interesting about this time is you have plants that are, uh, I wanna say, the the setting and then they are plants that are beings within the setting this victorian carpet bedding is a good example so these flowers are themselves so showy that they're kind of a destination they make you want to go in and investigate and so you come to this garden and there's something for you to interact with maybe you're not really interacting with that boxwood hedge there but that boxwood hedge is providing space so you see that um Plants are performing the function of being the setting, as well as often as also being the things within that setting that are asking for you to interact with them. And that's kind of new. Um, Hidcote in 1920. Now I skipped over Gertrude Jekyll, and I, I apologize to anyone about that. Um, Gertrude Jekyll, it, it's unclear in my mind. Um, but she did, she did something that Hitcoat also does, which is they combine the formalism and the wildness. I think there was sort of maybe a war between sort of randomly planted things to create a wild feeling and then ultra formalized gardens. Now, 
I want to make a distinction for us here where I think to a modern eye, there's wild and there's formal, but formal doesn't always mean the same thing. So remember during, um, uh, during Andre Lenotre, the, those really long alleys, those long trees that were you know, clipped into a high hedge, well, those were creating space and it was very formal, but the lines of sight were very, very long. Um, and they were meant to uh, uh, portray expanse. Whereas now, and beginning with the Victorians, that formalism was smaller and more intimate and created garden rooms that created surprise. So understand that, um, you know, a really long line of sight, that's not about surprise. That's about expanse uh, and space. And then this kind of formalism is more about, oh, I'll turn a corner and there's a surprise because a hedge was blocking my view. And then the next room is maybe very different than this one. And you can see here that the formal elements now are moving into the garden beds. That's new. So the fact that I might want to use a formal topiary as a punctuation mark in my wild bed, that's new. Um, so now the formalism isn't just acting as um, garden room walls, it's acting as uh, exclamation points in the wildness. There's this attempt to bridge wildness and formalism that I really like. <laughs> I want to talk about Roberta Burl Marx, um, who is a person that I'm underfamiliar with, admittedly. But a lot of the tropicals that we now um, see as specimens, even in um, ornamental gardens, though certainly also at botanical gardens, um, come or were popularized by him for their use. You can see that he's working in Brazil and the, the, the jungle is so wild. And so sometimes he'll cut through that with these incredibly clean, modern lines almost Matisse-like um, you know, blocks of color. Um, but he's also popularizing native plants to him in, in Brazil, plants that were native there, that are worthy of conservation. And, and he's proving that by saying, well, these actually have a lot of ornamental value and we shouldn't lose them. Um, Christopher Lloyd. <laughs> I'm moving through time so fast. I apologize, but I kind of have to. Um, Christopher Lloyd. Christopher Lloyd is uh, the sort of great creative luminary behind Great Dixter. And I think if you asked him, he'd tell you that some of his big contributions were fighting to make acceptable a much brighter and much more riotous palette of color. Um, and then also using plants that were from unexpected places um, and then planting them with success in his um, uh, Southern English garden. Um, one of the things that I like so much about what you see today at Great Dixter, um, and I have to credit, um, I have to credit the staff that's, that's there now, especially including um, Fergus Garrett, but there's this sense that actually the primary unit of the garden is not a flower. It's, um, or sorry, a plant. It's a combination of plants. It's the relation between plants. So just like a marriage is not two people, it's two people in a relation. It's what happens when those two people are together. Um, in that way, the fundamental unit of the garden here is considered to be what happens when two plants inter interact with each other. And that can be spatially and in their growth, but also how they appear aesthetically. So look at this on the right example, this glomus and this verbascum. You don't need flowers for that to be dynamic, um, but the contrast, they just sing when they're put together. Here are some other great examples. And again, you can see that the formalism has moved into the wildness. It's an element inside those wild beds. And that's so exciting. But you can see that there's a lot of fun with contrast and that the fundamental unit of the garden is now not a plant, but a relation of plants. Does that make sense? Beth Chatto is also, is maybe the person that I most associated with as foliage first. Um, let's make a garden that if it never flowered, uh, the foliage would still work. Um, and where maybe Christopher Lloyd went to that idea with more of a floral place. I think Beth Chatto went to that idea with more of a foliage place. Both are fantastic. Just look at this, this bed on the right here. It's a lot of green, right? A lot of the leaves are green. Not that there aren't those gorgeous New Zealand flax that really pop with color, but um, you can see how different the shapes of the leaves are. So again, if those never flowered, 
the bed would still be worth looking at. The other thing that Beth Chatto is really worth knowing, uh, knowing about for um, is that she um, and her husband, um, Andrew Chatto, um, instantiated in the garden a sense that, hey, this plant is from a dry place. I have a really dry area in my garden. So instead of trying to force that good soil in that spot or, or rich organic soil in that spot, I'm going to find a plant from you know, she's gardening in the UK, but maybe something from Turkey or the Caucasus would do really well in, in this spot. And so her gravel garden is such a great example of not fighting the land you're given, but embracing it and working with it. And then using um, a good intellectual approach to figure out what would grow there with all this artistic sensitivity that creates such a beautiful combination. On the bottom left there is what happens on a pond edge where it's exactly the opposite problem, it's too wet. And so you can see that beautiful Regersia is there with some ferns that again, the foliage really reacts against each other. Um, Pete Udolf, um, no one's more popular right now than Pete Udolf. <laughs> um, and admittedly, I have to say, I have a lot of reservations about um, his work and generally the movement that he's associated with, which is called the Dutch perennial new wave or some kind of combination of those words, um, less because I feel that it does anything wrong than because I feel like many, many people misunderstand it. Um, there is definitely a leaning on American native plants, as well as a style that's very drifty, and I hear it called naturalistic quite a lot. And I think people take that information and they decide, oh, this is ecological horticulture. This is what it looks like when we plant for the bees or the butterflies or the birds. Um, and that's just not really a fair characterization of this work. I, I wanna be very clear, I find this very, very beautiful, um, but I don't, uh, I, I would not call it natural, right? Um, salvias do not naturally grow in, in drifts that large. And a lot of those grasses have seeds that are so small that if you actually see them in habitat, they don't grow in drifts, they grow one-on-one, -on -one, like a one-offs along a sort of a sandy prairie or something like that. Um, and so this is not a low maintenance kind of gardening and it's not actually mimicking how these plants grow wildly. So I think this is a good time to think about the fact that when we say something is naturalistic, what do we mean by that? Naturalistic is a human concept. Nature is just nature. And what we find to be naturalistic, one, you know, one century might not look naturalistic to a person of the next, next century. To me, this is beautiful, but it's not natural. I also feel that um, one sense of beauty here, which is totally being engaged. Again, it's beautiful, but your sense of beauty is not thought to invite new knowledge. Um, I don't feel that I'm being asked to learn something new or that I'm being motivated to learn something new here. Um, maybe you have a different reaction and that's, that's fantastic. Um, but I feel that there's a sense of, the, here's my beauty, here's my intellect and they're not touching. Dan Pearson, Dan Pearson is so cool. Um, and he takes this Victorian concept of by my structures, by my house, I'm going to have a really formal garden or a, a more, more clearly a garden in which some level of human artifice is entered. And then I'm going to take my, my, out, my like, landscape out there, but he's bridging them where the Victorians, I think, probably had a fence to separate those two, two things fairly sharply. Um, Dan Pearson does this thing where he bleeds very gardeny gardens into a natural landscape in a way that feels very seamless and it feels very effortless. I have no idea the amount of, of effort and genius that has to go into it, but it's really fantastic. You can see there is some Pete Udolf influence here in the way certain things are grouped together and mass planted, but those drifts aren't quite so expansive. Um, you can also see there's more attention to foliage color um, contrast. Um, uh, although, again, the sort of, sort of flowers that come and go in succession in the extended season are very reminiscent. On the right here, you have a, a great palette that's just green, but who needs more color than that when the textures are so good? Um, on the left there is this really dense matrix planting. Um, and I love this style of planting where 
things are, are thought of as making space for each other in a really clear and intelligent way. So that fern is shaped like a fountain and then that grass fits underneath it. Um, they test those, those um, shapes tessellate beautifully. On the right there is again, this great moody, the sense of mood that happens that he's able to do because he's, um, his work um, engages a sense of, of wildness um, that feels, uh, it's curated, but it feels uh, very natural. And it feels like, um, it feels moody, right? <laughs> There's a mood to it. Um, I love these examples of, of his work. You can see that there's a sense here where we've moved beyond, um, we've moved beyond just beauty to a sense of fantasy ecology. Um, he's being inspired by actual ecologies and the way plants grow in the wild, but as though this were a fantasy place where just the most magnificent things did grow in the wild. I think that's where we're headed, by the way. I think. Um, we're the best gardeners that we see working today uh, almost create a fantasy ecology, almost as if to say, I have this land, and if this land were part of Arcadia or El Dorado, what would naturally grow there? And how would it grow there? What would it look like? And how do I create mood? Chanticleer. Yeah, okay. So I have to disclaim, I promise I'm not sponsored. I put together these slides long before I had any... Um, any inkling that I would be here working in any capacity, but it's just for a long time been one of my favorite gardens. Um, here you can see a whole bunch of things and I'll speak as we go, but these principles of contrast are very, very clear. You can see that there's specimen plantings that are also mixed with sort of natural setting plantings, if that makes sense. I think we have a sense that plants are now not just the setting, they are the things in the setting. There's a, a curated wildness on the left here. The fact that this is an agave americana, the true wild form of that plant, and it's not some really artificial looking variegated cultivar is important. You get a sense of calm or of um, nonchalance uh, that you wouldn't have if you chose something that looked a little bit more overbred. Um, the gravel garden on the left, there it is again, and it wouldn't be as powerful a garden if it didn't have to use so many straight species plants, because again, there's a sense that there's a fantasy ecology there. Even here on the, on the right, that lycopod, the Hupertia on the top of the shelf, that's, that's a wild form plant. It's just very well chosen. I also wanna say those principles of contrast and of the fundamental unit of a garden being less of a, an individual plant and being more of a relation of plants um, helps create mood. I think that's a little bit where mood comes from. And again, it's not just pretty things, it's things that make you stop and go, what is that? And when you go, what is that? That's how you know a garden has um, invited you into new knowledge. It's, uh, it's, it's motivated to get you to ask questions about what you're seeing. And that's an educational experience. So we've come full circle from the Botanic Garden of Padova where a garden, one of its purposes was to invite you into a knowing experience of the natural world. Um, but we're also doing beauty at the same time. And so our capacity for appreciating beauty and our, in our joyful curiosity and our intellect are both being engaged. I love this example on the left here. This is a variegated okra <laughs> that was planted, I believe last year in one of the entrance uh, gardens at Chanticleer. There is one plant in that pot and it's in a very front, you know, welcome to the garden kind of position. And another garden might have put um, just a huge amount of petunias in a pot or something. But you can see here that even one plant can be both interesting and beautiful. Um, I had to look that up to know what that was. Um, <laughs> and so the fact that it's a variegated okra and that it looks that spectacular is proof that you don't even need two plants to have it both ways. You can do interesting interest and beauty all at once um, if you're 
if you're careful, if you know what you're doing. This brings us to the Smithsonian, um, and I really love the Smithsonian. Um, I'm going to break down what the Smithsonian does in gardens that I find so interesting in a number of different um, points. Um, but I just love the Smithsonian gardens. And if you have never been to the Smithsonian before, or you've been, but you've only been to the museums and you rushed past all the plants, um, or you're going to plan a trip and you're like, why should I go to the gardens? I just want to explain that I do believe uh, that the Smithsonian does horticulture at the highest levels of, of horticultural thought. And I want to kind of explain how, and I want to encourage you to make time if you're visiting, don't just go to the museum. Understand that the gardens are also a museum and they're worth your time. And when you think of Smithsonian Gardens, you probably think of the Ina de Haupt Garden. It's so central and it's right there on the castle. And you can see here that it's just spectacular um, urban design, really. It's, it's planted urban design. Um, you need this kind of space in the city um, just to manage traffic and to give people a place to eat lunch. And it's just very useful, um, it's sort of practical, landscaping. And if that's all it were, it would still be totally worth it. But I want to, I want to argue that it's more than that. Um, one of the, the, one of the interests that the Smithsonian has had, I think since about the 1930s, is to explore um, flora and fauna of tropical biomes. And you can see this represented in the Smithsonian Gardens by many, many gorgeous tropical specimens that are that figure in the plantings as well as um, figure in the sort of tropical walk by the Freer Sackler Gallery in the Inide Haupt Garden. Um, and what I, so I just wanna show you, for example, there's the, there are these beds here and you think, oh, what a nice flowering sort of low hedge there as part of this um, knot design, except that it's Crossandra and Fundibuliformis, which is um, until recently where it's become much more popular, it was a really offbeat choice. It's very, very cool. And then on the left there is uh, you think, oh, what a nice sort of informal hedge in pots. It like directs traffic. It gives you a line of sight. But you look closer and you're like, what is that? I have never seen that before. And it's the dobe tree. It's a type of um, tropical dogwood. It's not related to dogwoods, but it's actually related to coffee and gardenias. But uh, this great um, bracts on those flowers, it looks like every fourth or fifth leaf is pure white. It's just magical and it's so fascinating. Again, beauty and interest all in one. But here are some great examples of some tropicals that you'll see throughout the garden. And you'll notice again that those principles of contrast are making each plant really shine as a specimen. So again, they're individuals, but their individuality is being accented by the way that they're so um, juxtaposed in color or texture from their neighbors. Just some fantastic tropical plants you'll see if you go to the Ina de Haupt Garden. The next institutional interest I want to talk about is, um, you know, there's a natural history museum. You want to see some natural history embodied in the, in the landscape, and, and plants are a big part of that. Um, plants that demonstrate ecologies and national partner, uh, natural partnerships. Um, you'll see a lot of, of native plants if you go to the Smithsonian. Uh, there's a real focus on that, and it's not an accident. It's because these plants that are native to the area in which they're planted can function uh, uh, in their ecological role that they were that they evolved to perform. So these plants have relationships with, with local pollinators, for example. So each plant is not just an animal in a zoo that's just taken out of context, and it's not really it's kind of inert with respect to the rest of the ecology. These are um, ecologically active plants. And you can see on the left there here, I love this. Um, yeah, there's these great caladiums that come out for the summer to punch up this bed. Um, and again, that's another tropical for you to kind of uh, uh, look at those tropical, tropical plants. Um, but there's also this Chrysogonum Chris virginianum here that is a, a, a native R. Another great plant that should be in more shade gardens, and it grows great with this caladium. Uh, but again, a great native plant that just sort of flowers on and off all summer. About the tropicals, I think I forgot to mention um, there is the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institution in Panama. And so 
Um, not that all of the tropicals that are in the Enidae Help Garden come from that research station, but I just want to, uh, uh, the gardens just like the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institution um, are embodiments of this interest in tropical biomes. Institutional interest three. Um, I, I kind of hesitate to use the word living fossil plants because that kind of misses the mark in several ways. But um, that's basically what I mean. I mean, plants with paleobotany, educational opportunities or implications. So you'll see a lot of conifers, conifers in other gymnosperms, uh, like cycads, for example. Um, I, this is one of my favorite plantings I've ever seen anywhere. And this is shout out to James Gagliardi, who did this outside the Natural History Museum. But you can see all sorts of plants that have um, uh, that are in a way living fossils or that they're related to plants that were really dominant at the time of the dinosaurs. And you walk through these doors and you take a few turns and you're at the dinosaur hall. So it's, it's appropriate. On the left here, we have the Metasequoia glyptostrobioides. Um, and this is a cultivar with, with sort of chartreuse needles, gorgeous. But again, that plant was thought to be extinct until it was rediscovered in, I think, 1945. On the bottom left there, we have cycads, which were once really dominant plants um, in the Jurassic period. And then um, in the Cretaceous period, the, the flowering plants, the angiosperms take over. Uh, in the middle here, I love this monkey puzzle tree. This is from this really old group of conifers um, that are Southern uh, hemisphere conifers that are just so, so cool. Um, on the uh, bottom here, we have tree ferns that really also have that vibe. Um, and ferns are another prehistoric group of plants and more cycads. And these are tender ones that are planted out just for the summer. And on the right, um, this elephant ear, you know, I thought, well, an elephant ear is technically a flowering plant. Uh, you don't usually grow it for its flowers, um, but it is a flowering plant. I just thought, oh, it kind of looks dinosaur-y. I guess they just threw it in there um, as set dressing. But it turns out, actually, that the some of these aeroids date really, really far back. There are excavation sites um, uh, for dinosaurs in, in Utah, I think, that um, actually have uncovered uh, Colocasia esculenta. So that's... Um, those plants go way farther back in the fossil record than I, than I thought they did. So they're a great representation of a, a prehistoric time. Uh, institutional interest number five. Um, I, uh, I only chose one example here because it was one that I knew about and I, I really liked for a long time, but I'm, uh, there are others, especially I think in the orchid collection, which is um, really amazing at the Smithsonian. But I want to say um, current botanical exploration and plant taxonomy as this institutional interest. Um, and my example is the curcuma mayamarensis right here. This was described to science in, I think the early 2010s. Um, and yet here you can see it in the Ripley garden. So here it is on the right, and then here it gets moved. Um, and here it is just in the greenhouse as, as the specimen that it is. But you know, be aware that you're walking through the Smithsonian gardens and you may be seeing things that no one else has. Um, it's just that, that level of collection, it's really good. Institutional interest number six. So this is an interesting one. So as a national museum complex representing the world horticulturally with an American focus, there's sort of two prongs to this. One is to say, well, we want, you know, Americans come here and we're, we want to represent the whole world. And so a lot of these plants are exotics and that's, that's part of the mission. On the other hand, a lot of people who maybe from certain parts of the Americas who are of the US who maybe haven't lived a lot of other places in the US or maybe people who come from other countries, maybe they want an American experience. And so you want to um, focus on plants that evoke America. Um, and I'll show you what I mean here. So on the left here, this is in the Ripley Garden in DC, which is not in the Southwest. And yet there's sort of a Southwestern feel. So you get to, you get to travel uh, without traveling. Um, and on the right here, this um, bromeliad is actually not um, not a Southwest desert plant, but it has that sort of, um, it, it evokes that same thing. Same similar evocative thing going on here with the stylized prairie. Um, neither of those plants, well, that's not, a, that's not a, re, a, a literal recreation of any true prairie habitat because those cone flowers are actually a cultivated variety. Um, so they're not a wild form, form plant, but there's beautiful um, stylistic, uh, representation of a prairie. It just gives you everything you've wanted out of a prairie. On the right here, this is outside um, Aaron's space. 
um, you have hardy palms and hardy bananas. And yes, there are palms and bananas that survive uh, the DC winters and come back every year, they're perennial. Um, but when you go there, you feel that you've traveled to Kennedy Space Center, which is in Florida, right? So you go to this building and you feel as though you're participating in NASA. You feel like you're there, you're part of it. It's really immersive because the, the, the setting has been dressed that way. Um, so in another garden where that palm and that banana might have meant something else, it might have meant we're exploring tropicals. Here it means you're kind of in Florida, right? And in the summer, it feels like that. On the bottom right here, you have um, maybe more of a historical interpretation of that. And so you have um, a re of representing the US. So this is a victory garden outside the American History Museum. And on the left there is sort of um, a kind of, a, I like to call it a Main Street USA kind of a hanging basket. So yeah, that lobiel is from South Africa, but it's for a long time been in the US ornamental trade as a hanging basket plant. And on the, in the middle here, um, you know, the castle is itself a building with a historical interest to American history. And, and this urn is too, for example. And yet there it is planted around with um, American native plants. Institutional interest number seven, um, you know, it is, uh, it is a public outdoor space and it is therefore, especially at an education institution, it is therefore a great opportunity to model the best thinking that is going on in horticulture today. Um, so I wanted to just share this slide of the Ripley Garden to represent some of the lessons that we learned as we talked through today. So we have those, those principles of contrast where the foliage, so the foliages contrast and then the flowers contrast. And you have, um, uh, you have a sense of specimen interest, but you get that specimen interest through the relations of plants, through the friction two plants have when they're planted next to each other. And so you have um, units and yet you also have combinations. Um, you have mood because um, this sort of celebratory uh, uh, celebration of botanic diversity is in itself a really joyful mood. Um, you do also have, I want to say, some fantasy ecologies going on, like, like here and, and here. Um, and you have specimen interest plants, and you have these plants being um, in the setting, things that are asking you to ask questions about them. They are beings to interact with in the setting, while also being the setting. Um, you have common plants and rare plants, or plants that are common in one part of the country, but not in another. And then you just have really creative combinations like this. I, I, shout out to Rick Schilling, um, who does, in my opinion, the best hanging baskets in the world. <laughs> he has some of these really cool choices that he puts together. Um, and I wish he got more credit for them. Uh, here's another one. Oh my gosh, look at, look at, look at that one. Oh, I love that hanging basket. Um, again, there's the conifers, the, the plants with paleobotany implications, and the cycad that has paleobotany implications, and there's southwest desert plants representing different part of the U.S., and tropicals that um, represent institutional interest in tropicals, and also Hawaii, which let's not forget that's part of the country too. Um, and so you have this level of thinking that is really, really um, at the best levels, I want to say. I think we've never asked gardens to do more thinking or be thinking about more things. And I think we're doing it. And I think evidence of that is that when I go to the Smithsonian Gardens, I don't feel as though the natural world and all of its sort of wildness and mystery is being domesticated. I feel that it's being represented. I feel like I'm being put in touch with the sort of wild and um, awe-inspiring nature of the natural world. Uh, I don't just say, oh, wow, that's beautiful. Although I do say that's beautiful. I also say, what is that? Uh, let me look that up. How interesting is that? Yeah, <laughs> it's just really good. Really, really, really good horticulture. So I, again, those are our questions. And I, I wanna say we've arrived at a place in horticulture where we actually think of our sense of beauty as inviting knowledge, um, that our sense of beauty is actually a part of why we want to learn and what makes learning so fun and how we learn. 
And conversely, that um, if a garden is for pleasure, well, let's not forget that um, having your curiosity satisfied is a pleasurable experience. I don't think that gardens have to be interesting or beautiful. I think the best gardens do both. Um, I think that we are not domesticating the wild, uh, the sort of wildness and the splendor of the natural world. I think we're recapitulating it in a, in a smaller setting where we can experience it all in one place. Um, does the garden mimic an ecology? Yeah, I think we're at a point where we're doing horticulture thinking where um, our goal is to create a fantasy ecology. It's not just a, some pretty plants. It's if this were a mythical place, what would grow there? What mythical things would grow there? How would they grow there? Um, and we get that by having plants that are in combination and, and specimens, that create, specimens that are also in contrast with other things where they both shine as individuals and as combinations. I think we get that moodiness from understanding that in a garden where the fundamental unit is the relation of plants, that plant, a garden is more than the sum of its parts. Um, so I think mood comes out of this sense that actually it's the way plants clash that is the fundamental unit. Um, and I think we're also at a point where, you know, you go to the Mary Livingston Ripley Garden and you'll see uh, a rare, just described ginger, but you'll also see a petunia. And I love that about it. I love that there's no one that it excludes. So I want to end by just showing you what, the, what does this look like if we take all of those lessons and, and turn them onto this little bed in the Ripley Garden. It's a small little, little piece of the garden. And yet you have all of those principles there in a way that's so fascinating. So there's that hosta, this variegated hosta up here. And guess what? That's an Asian plant that comes from that Asian plant collecting craze. So there's sort of some uh, history of horticulture there. Um, here we have a native ecology and an exotic tropical plant in the form of this uh, uh, Aristolochia fimbriata or Dutchman's pipe vine, which is an exotic plant but hosts native swallowtail butterflies. Um, I love that this flame leaf euphorbia species, which by the way, I don't think has ever been scientifically determined what species of euphorbia it is. So there's a little bit of a scientific mystery going on there. Um, and then this plectranthus are both tropicals that are put in and yet they're not put in for their way of just shamelessly flowering. They're put in there for their delicacy of foliage that just um, elevates the hardy plants that are there. I love this example too. So those hurricane lilies look like something out of Mars. I mean, they just look like the most crazy exotic things. Um, and they're not actually native to the US but they have naturalized in the US, um, particularly in the Southeast. And so here's a little taste of the Southeast for you. Um, it, it does create a sense of place while also subverting it. I think the best gardens do that. And here on the bottom, this beautiful metallic hemographis that just pokes in is a touch of the exotic as well. So I think that um, brings us to, well, what do we think the future of horticulture is gonna be? And I don't know, <laughs> nobody knows. That's the fun thing. The, the fun is in, is in finding out. Um, but at the very beginning, I said there were gardening traditions we weren't going to explore because they operated um, on levels of thought that connected with other disciplines, especially intellectual or spiritual disciplines. But you'll notice that now we're asking of horticulture more than has ever been asked of horticulture. So Andre Lenotre, he wanted beauty and he wanted expanse and architecture. But now we say, well, we want that, but we also want you know, surprise and garden rooms, and we want natives, and we want exotics, and we want to create a sense of place, and we want to subvert one. Oh, and by the way, give us seasonality. That way we have, we feel grounded in our sense of time. As time passes, it's not lost on us because the trees change color, or the tulips come, or the, um, I don't know, the aromitalicum comes up, in the, and that means it's winter. So demarcating time to give us a sense of time and then throw, give us native plants too. That way we feel tied to the site on which we're living. Um, the sense of time and place, those are things that, you know, we used to ask of the church or we used to ask of 
philosophic traditions, and now we're asking them of horticulture, and I think that's fascinating, and that finally puts horticulture in a in a in a place where it can interrogate these other gardening practices that have always tied into meditative or philosophic or religious traditions. But we will have to be sure that when we try to learn lessons from them, that we will do so with intellectual rigor and responsibility to the, 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 the meditative and philosophic and religious practices that they're tied to. I, I, what I'd like not to see is the same thing that happens with yoga where you know people are doing yoga for exercise or like yoga for stretching and you're like well you can like there's nothing wrong with that but you're kind of missing the entire tradition and what that tradition brought to that practice and what that practice was meant to do for you in your you know religious uh, life or something right like so you can yeah, go to yoga but understand that if you're not doing that as a monk at a Zen temple, then you're missing out on what it's really for, right? And I don't want to have a, I don't want to just, you know, put some sand and put a rock because it looks like Ryuanji here. I want to think about, well, what was this garden really trying to do or say? What level of symbolism was it operating on? And if I borrow something from this tradition to do it in a way that respects the depth of its choices. Um, on the other hand, there's just some fun ideas that I'd, I'd love to see, you know, taken in. If you think, well, what are the limits of horticulture? Well, is what Andy Goldsworthy does horticulture? Maybe. I mean, the way you stack wood is, is a great, you know, maybe you want to do that in your garden, or maybe you want to create these sculptures that reflect on water. I don't know. Um, I also have a couple of shots in this on this um, slide of, of um, aquascaping, which is um, basically horticulture in a fish tank, where you where the point of the fish tank is the plants rather than the fish. And the approach to, the, to that discipline is kind of different, and you get really different results than you tend to get um, when you let really great horticulturists loose. Not that either is better or worse, but I kind of want to see one inspired by the other. I think that'd be great. Um, what I can tell you is that there are a lot of really, really, really cool plants um, in the world. And that I don't think we're ever going to run out <laughs> of, of things to spur our creativity with. I think we have... Um, I love Chopin, for example, but he had 12 notes. We have every plant in the world. And sure, not every, not every plant is going to grow everywhere. But I think we have so many opportunities to do horticulture that invites wonder and gets people excited about living on this planet and what that means. And I think plants can get us there. And I think that's really exciting. And that's what I have for you today. So. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, please feel free to email me any questions that's there. Uh, that's my email address right there. Thank you. Actually, Eric, I'm really disappointed. <laughs> um, only because we don't have any time left to discuss all the questions that you put into our minds. So you're going to have to come back. Okay. And it's going to have to be more of a conversation uh, between us because I don't think you should call this the art of high gardening. I think this is the philosophy of mm. gardening. And yes, art is a very important part of it, but definitely philosophical thoughts uh, you've driven. And uh, for those in the audience, the question that you've asked have put more questions into my head mm. and more questions that I think we all should be asking. So even though we won't have time to uh, review all of them today, but I want to bring you back. I think you brought some really important parts. And to let people know, I was really not keen initially when Eric contacted me because I didn't want it to, this presentation to look like it was a love fest for Smithsonian Gardens. But I think you've all seen some wonderful, wonderful examples of gardening in urban areas and what it means to be part of the Smithsonian as a museum and as a space that so many people come to enjoy, be excited, be, and you told me this, be mad, and we get a lot of people mad at us. Um, and just, it, it, that's a perfect. Josh, thank you. Very thought provoking with what you've included in this presentation. So thank you for that. Thank you. Now, I, I, I'm going I'm to try to find one, one, one question that I can really 
engage more with these thoughts. Oh, here's one. Okay, here's one that's not looking at anything we've talked about, but something I think you should think about. Are there any 21st century gardens created by and in economically disadvantaged and immigrant communities that inspire you? How do they fit in? Mm -hmm. Well, what I, the one that initially comes to mind, um, because partly because it was from a climate that meant so much when I was in San Diego as an inspiration was Kirsten Bosch in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, South Africa, um, it's not that there aren't sort of wealthier areas of it or something, um, but that, you know, there has been so much historical strife there that it's kind of a great thing to see a botanical garden come out of that. Mm -hmm. At a time when sometimes it's difficult to be proud to be an American, the fact that my taxpayer dollars are going to the Smithsonian to support horticulture at this level makes me really happy to be an American and to be in this country and to have the government we have, if that makes sense. Um, I don't always feel that way, but this is one of the things that really makes me feel that way. Um, and I, it, when a garden like that can emerge out of a, a maybe a political situation that's um, fraught or, or a situation that just took so many decades to resolve as well as they did, um, it's really impressive. But yeah, Kirsten Bosch absolutely is a collection. And um, if you've never bought seeds from Silver Hill Seeds, um, they are loosely related with uh, uh, Kirsten Bosch and you should take a look at their seed catalog. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for a very engaging discussion. Yeah. And I'm, I'm serious. We'll have to figure out when you have time in Shane together because I know they're going to work you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thanks again. And thanks for everyone in the audience. And I apologize for not getting to all the questions, but please think about them. I think these are questions we should answer ourselves and think about what does gardening mean to you? That was also brought up. You know, we wouldn't be able to do at my home. I'm not going to be able to recreate what we create downtown. But I think my garden has just as much philosophy as the Ripley or the fossil garden or anything else that goes along with it. And I hope you all do too. Thanks. Keep having again. wonder about the natural world. Yes. Let your garden wonder. look like it. Yep. And how we fit into it. So. Thank you, Eric, and thank, thank you. you everyone that's joined us. Have a good afternoon.